right, Dr. Shadi Rinpoche here, board certified surgeon, chief of specialty part owner of True Care for Pets, Studio City, Los Angeles, California. We are here today joined by Lindsay and Jay. Hi. Um, today we're going to talk about when you go to the veterinarian and they sneak your dog or cat into the dreaded back. Dun, and dun, dun, dun. Dun. <laughs> Ow, sunburn. <laughs> and they, Lindsay had a bad sunburn and Jay just touched her. So we're going to talk about why we do this. Um, We'll start with that, and then we'll talk about how we handle pets that are mm, less than pleased, shall we say, to be at the veterinary office. So this is a complaint that I hear a lot from, usually from general practitioners, family veterinarians, like the clients will complain and say they took my dog to the back and I don't know what they did to my dog. He's just back there forever. And so we want to explain why veterinarians do that. It's not really malicious, so um, who wants to start? Well, a lot of the cases we see seem to be orthopedic, and we want to watch them walk without distractions from other pets or clients. Yeah, a lot of times these pets will, they'll, um, they need more room to be examined if they're doing orthopedic examinations. And so the exam rooms are very tiny. So you want to have like long hallways, or sometimes you even go outside if the pet is like slipping and sliding on our floors. So we'll go outside where there's good footing, there's concrete footing like in our parking lot, and it's good traction. So we can watch the pet walk around more. Because sometimes you won't see limping, it's consistent, you know, or you're looking to make sure it's like, oh, it's neurologic or orthopedic. So we'll borrow, we'll borrow your pet for an examination. Cats, the same thing too. Sometimes cats, we have to release them into an enclosure so we can actually watch them walk because cats will hide under furniture or run away or start climbing on desks. So we want to make sure that we can get them to separate areas we can evaluate their gates. Why else would we bring pets to the, to the back area? Well, we're in ER facility so when pets come in they come in usually in emergent situations so a lot of times what we do and this is similar to what they do in human hospitals is you speak with a nurse in the lobby as kind of a triage so if you've been to a human ER you meet the nurse in the lobby tell them what your problems are and then you go to wait well what we do here is after that point, when we quote unquote triage you in the lobby, find out what the history is, what the presenting complaint is, we then usually take the pet back to a treatment area to perform vital signs and get an initial assessment by the doctor just to see how stable the pet is. Can it wait in the lobby? Can it wait in an exam room? Can it wait in a cage? Where does it need to be? And I think that fear for clients is huge because they don't know what's happening. Um, and a lot of times they do a pushback to that when we say, okay, I'm going to take your pet to the back um, because they don't know what's happening. They can't see it. They're very emotional, very upset and worried about their baby. So I wish that clients would understand that none of this is done maliciously. It's actually done for the best um, intentions for your pet and its safety and its health. Yep, and so some, some pets when they come here, especially in an emergency hospital, they need therapy immediately. They need oxygen therapy, they need pain medication. So we wanna get them right to the to the uh, back area where all of our all of our fancy equipment is and all of our, our expert staff are located and gets things started. And that, that may mean that a professional will not be speaking to you right away once you enter our doors, but it's for good reason. We wanna make sure that your pet is, is stable, cardiovascularly stable, Make sure that if you need any kind of immediate therapy, like pain medication or oxygen, something like that, that we can tend to it immediately because obviously your pet's health comes first. That's why you're here. And you get an examination performed by the doctor much faster that way. So when clients refuse to let us bring their pets in the back, it immediately increases the wait time. And it's not done um, to punish clients who refuse to let us take their pets back. It just happens that way because when your pet is taken back to the treatment area and the doctor's right there, although they may be tending to another case, they may be um, on a phone call, they can still assess your pet and decide how severe the situation is, what therapies need to be done. And that happens within moments of it, us taking your dog or cat to the back of the hospital or to the treatment area. Whereas if the client was to say, I don't want you to do that. I want to wait with my pet till the doctor is available. That automatically increases your wait time because of the reasons I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We need to prioritize too what pets get seen. So we'll have sometimes we'll have a handful of dogs and cats walk in here with their owners. And um, at the same time, in the middle of the night for emergencies. And so we've got to figure out, okay, well, we have a, we have a limited number of space, limited number of, of uh, support staff. 
we need to make sure that we prioritize which pets get care first. I mean, that's a, that's the case in any hospital. And then we can sort of prioritize. And so the best way for us to prioritize is to bring your pet to the back, have them evaluated by our emergency doctor, and they can figure out who should go, who should be first, second, third, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Great. I think also another reason why we bring your pets to the back is for behavioral reasons. We all... Um, you or you know you know somebody who has a pet that's more protective around the pet owner than when they're separate from the owner. And so uh, sometimes these pets are very difficult to examine in front of you, the pet owner, but once you bring them away from you into an area full of strangers, they calm down. And so then they're easier to, to examine. So for behavioral reasons too, we'll bring your pets to the back. And a lot of times we can do the full examination with, with really minimal restraint, Everything from rectal exams to listening to heart and lungs to even even feeling areas might be painful or uncomfortable, they behave much differently when they're away from you for those pets that are overprotective, that they're overprotective of you. And then I guess the, the next question that comes from that is from the owner, why can't I go back with it? Now, maybe not the behavioral cases because you just explained that, but for like the triages or just the exams, the orthopedic exams, why don't we let pets into the treatment areas of our hospital? Um, and that's actually for legal reasons. Um, we have obviously workman's comp insurance, which covers our employees should they get bitten, scratched, fall, um, whatever you can think of that should happen to them. Our workman's comp insurance does not cover owners, um, which means that if you come into the back and you become injured, we, um, we're looking at a whole different scenario and situation that we have to deal with. So from a legal standpoint, that is the reason why we generally do not let owners in the back. Very occasionally a doctor um, may want the owner to come back to see a wound or a part of the animal or to say goodbye to their pet if they're leaving it for surgery or procedure. But those are very brief moments. We don't allow owners to be in the back for long extended periods of time. Absolutely. Yep. It's a liability thing for sure. What other reasons can you guys think of that we bring bring pets to the back? To perform simple procedures, vaccines, nail trims, clipping cleans. Mm, anal gland expressions. Yeah, things like yeah. that. Yeah. Some pet owners don't even like to see their pets having their temperature taken or if they're squeamish mm. in those areas. Mm. They don't want to see blood. If you're drawing blood, yeah, they don't no want to blood. see it. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in fact, actually, the other the reverse situation, you, you as a pet owner, if you don't want to see that stuff and just ask to not be part of it, they either can take your pet to the back or you can just go back to the lobby and they'll do their, the veterinarian will do their thing in the exam room without you there, for sure. So now in this scenario where your, let's say your pet is just out of control, like you have a very, very aggressive dog or cat, they're just, they're just scared or they have a, a history of abuse or they just got rescued and the, the history is kind of sketchy. Um, how, well, let's answer the question of how us as veterinary staff, experienced professionals manage pets that are otherwise unmanageable. So I would say if you have a relationship with any veterinarian, um, it's wonderful to get some sort of anti-anxiety medications for dogs or cats prior to the vet visit. And if you call your veterinarian and say, hey, I scheduled an appointment for Tuesday and Fluffy is really anxious or he tends to try to bite, can I have a sedative or an anti-anxiety medication? Trust me, that vet will want to give you that medication, right? It makes our life easier. (laughs) Um, So don't be afraid or nervous or uncomfortable to call and let the vet know that this is how your pet is. You've seen it in the past and they would do much better provided a tranquilizer or something 30 minutes before their visit. We're happy to do that. And I think most of the time these medications are given, what, 30, 20 or 30 minutes before yeah. you get to the vet hospital? So you have to time it right. So the approximately what time your appointment is and you sort of plan ahead depending on your commute and traffic. And so you. Um, and I think the common medications we use, there are some that are like over-the-counter, right? I think Benadryl is a, a common one people use. If if the, the problem is very minor, um, I would say generally in cats, we have seen gabapentin be the new medication mm-hmm. that we're using for sedation. And gabapentin in people is called Neurontin. It's the same medication. Yeah. Don't give your own Neurontin to your cat because the dose is way too high. Mm-hmm. Um, call and ask your vet. They'll prescribe a compounded version for you. 
you. Um, in dogs, we use Ace, Promazine, and Trazodone, things like that. Yeah, those are two different sedatives. They're also very good. Yeah. And also gabapentin as well. Um, the human formulation, some of them have xylitol in them, which is toxic for animals. So That's the human liquid formulation mm -hmm. um, is mixed with xylitol to make it sweeter. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we use yeah. compounded gabapentin for cats because um, that is mm -hmm. a concern. Mm -hmm. And then, so for those pets that are, that you're doing the sedation thing and it's just not working, they're still out of control, um, uh, some owners will actually bring in their own muzzles for their dogs. So you'll have a, 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 a muzzle that you can then put on your pet and at least that begins the process of initiating safety for the, for the veterinary staff. And if that's where you are at in your relationship with your pet and the vet, <laughs> um, you should start muzzle training at home, which is just creating a good association with the muzzle, um, preferably a basket muzzle because that can be used long term. Um, we don't like the normal cloth muzzles to be on the pets for an extended period of time because they can't pant very well. Um, but you can start with the basket muzzle treats, peanut butter, whatever, and just get them used to putting it on their face, uh, get them used to latching it having it on for five, 10 minutes. There's tons of YouTube videos out there and trainers that can help you get your pet muzzle trained um, if you worry that your pet is gonna bite no matter what. And there are, there are different types of muzzles like Lindsay just said. So there's, I've seen the basket muzzles that can come in either plastic or metal. Mm -hmm. I've seen the, um, the leather muzzles as well. And then also there's the, the cloth or like rewashable yeah. uh, muzzles also that you can get. And those are the ones that I've, that I've seen. Yeah. Now, if your pet is a biter and it's um, a brachiocephalic, so it looks like it ran headfirst into a wall, like Aww. a bulldog or a pug, these types of muzzles so will cute. not work for you. Um, they do make special uh, brachiocephalic muzzles, but I don't recommend using those. Just bring your pet in and, and we'll deal with it. Yeah. So if you don't have a muzzle or you don't want to do this type of training or you don't want to spend the money on a muzzle, then every veterinary office will have muzzles of all different sizes, shapes and they'll they'll use it and and so if we have to we'll either we'll either ask you as a pet owner to put the muzzle on the pet if the pet's more comfortable with you or we'll try to put the muzzle on while you're in the room otherwise we'll, we may have to borrow your pet from the examination room bring them to the dreaded back and put the muzzle on ourselves and they also do make cat muzzles too but that's not this not that's not something that you would put necessarily place at home we would have that placed here if we need to do that also it kind of covers the front half of the face so it, not only does it does it um keep the mouth closed so that we don't get bit but it also covers the eyes to try and help minimize stimulation and I guess if all else fails, you don't know your pet's going to act the way it does when you get there. Um, we're equipped to handle it. We can give um, sedatives through the muscle or under the skin um, that are really easy to give. Injections. Even, yeah, yeah, even in a dog that's lunging and trying to bite us, we have ways um, to do these things. And we all work towards being fear-free, which means that we use the most <laughs> friendly practices. Um you know, as friendly as possible when dealing with these fractious pets. So I don't want you to think that, oh, my dog is so bad, I can never bring it to the vet because they're just going to have to manhandle it or beat it or whatever. Um, we don't do any of those things. We have very humane ways of handling pets. Worst case scenario, they get a quick little shot in the butt and go to sleep and then we do what we need to do. Yeah, we're doing this with the idea that the benefits of the veterinary examination, what we have to do to your pet, outweigh the risks of the mild sedation or the stress or anxiety that you or your pet is, is going to feel during this process. It, you know, you're seeing your vet, what, maybe once or twice a year if you're not developing any problems. So once or twice a year, you go through this little bit of hell to get your stressed out dog or cat to the vet. I mean, it's worth it. It's a, it's a necessary evil, unfortunately, and that's the nature of our profession. We don't have any other way of avoiding it. And if you just got a puppy, um, I recommend taking it to the vet frequently in the first few months, um, taking it in, get it weighed, have the staff play with it, give it treats, um, assuming it's had at least a round of vaccines, um, get it used to going into that place and to the people. And it may not be that you go to that vet forever, but it kind of desensitizes the pet to what a veterinarian is early on. I mean, a lot of times we don't get dogs as puppies, but if you do, um, I'm sure your general practice vet would be happy to see a cute puppy mm -hmm. once a week. Oh yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll touch their feet to make sure they don't get too shy with, with, uh, uh touching their paw pads. We'll, we'll play with their ears, clean their ears. So they don't get used. They get used to us handling the ears as well. These are sensitive areas for the, a lot of these pets. 
So you get them started when they're young. You can do oral exams. You open their mouth when they're young and get them used to like, it's okay if we open your mouth, take a look inside. And that way they get used to it at a young age. And so then let's move on to fractious cats. <laughs> There's, uh, I mentioned beforehand that we have muzzles for cats. We also do have these really big th leather uh, gloves, right? Like thick leather gloves. Yeah, I don't recommend They're using tough to those, use. though. That's last resort. We have cat bags, though. What's a cat bag, Jay? You put the cat in a bag, and it's, <laughs> <laughs> its head is showing, and you can, like, take a leg out if you just need to, like, place a catheter or whatever. It just isolates a part of the body to work on safely. Have you ever tried to put an angry cat in a bag and zip it up? <laughs> No. <laughs> okay, it doesn't really work that well. Not an angry cat. That's yeah, why, a wiggly cat. Why are you going to put a nice cat in a bag? No, it, um, cat bags are quite... <laughs> cat in a bag. Yeah. They're, yours now. Yeah, they don't... Yeah, I don't even have words for cat bags. <laughs> um, big fluffy towels are usually, or blankets are what we use. Trying to get a cat that's like this into a tiny little bag. Yeah, not... Yeah. Not... I, I know you guys could all see me do this. Yeah. <laughs> Um, She's waving her hands in the air <laughs> like she don't care. Um, but um, definitely if you know your cat gets stressed out, call ahead, get gabapentin. There's also something called Feel Away, which is a feline um, pheromone. They just started selling it at Petco and PetSmart, so you no longer need to go into the vet to get it. It comes as a spray, a wipe, or a diffuser. So if you know you're getting ready to go to the vet, you can buy some of the feel away, and you can also buy it on Amazon too, and coat the, the carrier in it, your car, the exam room once you get there. Most hospitals will have some feel away um, to do that as well. If you're going to your general practice and you have a cat, you may want to look into a cat-friendly um, or a cat-certified fear-free practice because they're going to be um, apt to deal with these kinds of things with nervous cats. Um, if your cat loves everyone, then by all means go anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but if your cat's a little more nervous or on the difficult side, definitely find one of those fear-free certified cat practices because they'll really be able to handle it. But feel away, um, get your cat used to the carrier so that you don't miss your appointment because you spent three hours trying to shove them in there. Mm -hmm. um, and if you need to call ahead of time for sedatives, do it. All great advice. So uh, hopefully this episode gave some insight as far as why we bring these pests to the back and how what kind of measures we use to handle those pests that don't really want to be at the veterinarian. Um, we try to make the experience as pleasant as possible for you and for your pet. Of course, it's a case-by-case -case basis, but there are on occasion some animals that just get to the point where it's almost life-threatening that they get so worked up at the hospital that it's almost not worth it unless it's a true emergency. But that's, a, that's something you and your veterinarian can discuss. Those are rare, rare types of cases. Um, and so uh, with, with, um, with today's digital world being, being at our fingertips, there's ways of sending videos of your, whatever your pet's doing or, um, or emailing. You can text pictures or something like that. You can figure out a way to have your pet looked at, somewhat looked at by your veterinarian from home if you can't bring your pet in. But uh, by all means, the majority of dogs and cats, we can manage them in the hospital and the benefits of the stressful trip are certainly uh, outweigh any risks that are involved. Great, thanks. Uh, this is uh, uh, Dr. Shadi Rayfidge and we have Jay and Lindsay here from True Care for Pets, Studio City, Los Angeles. We'll see you, no, oh, we'll talk to you. We'll talk to you the next episode. We'll talk to you next time. We'll talk to you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.